Welcome everyone. I'm Jamie Anunzio, an orthopaedic registrar at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, and today I will guide you through a standard knee history and examination appropriate for elective or trauma patients. You may wish to pause, skip forward, and or go back as necessary. To start your orthopaedic assessment, you should perform hand hygiene, introduce yourself, identify the patient, explain the history and examination process, gain consent, and ensure appropriate exposure and positioning. Attention to the patient should start as they walk in the room, with particular attention to the patient's face for any signs of pain or apprehension, their gait, presence or absence of walking aids, and comparison to the contralateral limb. Take a targeted history. Importantly, ascertain the mechanism of injury and the symptoms in the patient's own words. In a trauma scenario, the mechanism of injury may allow you to identify the most likely pathology. A common mechanism is a twisting knee injury with a lateral blow to the knee resulting in a valgus force across it which may result in a terrible triad of anterior cruciate ligament, medial collateral ligament and meniscal injury. Be mindful of different positions of the knee at time of impact including extended, hyperextended or flexed as this affects the likely injury pattern. Pain history. We suggest using the Socrates acronym. Sight. Where is the pain or the maximal site of pain? Pain arising in the hip joint and or lumbosacral spine may manifest in the knee and sometimes knee pain may be the only symptom. Onset. When did the pain start and was it sudden or gradual? Include also whether it was progressive or regressive. Character. What is the pain like? An ache or stabbing or burning? Radiation. Does the pain radiate anywhere? Associated symptoms. Are there any other signs or symptoms which are associated with the pain? Time course. Does the pain follow any pattern? Exacerbating or relieving factors. Does anything change the pain? And finally, severity. How bad is the pain? Now take a functional history. Inquire about any limp, inability to run or negotiate stairs, and any impacts on activities of daily living. Also inquire about their walking distance. Additionally, ask if there's any stiffness and whether or not it's predominant in the morning or at night, bilateral or unilateral, and also screen for any other joint involvement. Furthermore, ask specifically if any swellings are present, and if so, the duration of these symptoms, its evolution, whether or not it's painful, and if it's local versus generalized. Specific to the knee, Inquire about the following. Any locking, clicking, which may be suggestive of a loose body or meniscal tear. Being cognizant of the fact that true locking versus pseudo locking is different and there may be an intraarticular mechanical block or pain inhibition, respectively. Additionally, inquire regarding knee instability, including giving way which may represent ligamentous instability or may be due to pain. Anterior cruciate ligament injuries may occur during a twisting knee injury and manifest as giving way, particularly with difficulty with sideways movements or oblique movements. This is also true for medial collateral ligament injuries, which may be exacerbated by the same. Posterior cruciate ligament injuries as well as posterolateral corner injuries, may manifest as instability, particularly with difficulty going downstairs. Patella instability may also present with giving way. 
Remember, in a patient with any signs of instability, it is reasonable to assess for signs of hypermobility using a laxity score such as Baton score. Furthermore, screen for any red flags including weight loss, neurovascular changes, night pain, fevers or night sweats, swelling in young patients and erythema. Please note, remember also to ask what they've tried before. You may lose some rapport with the patient if your management plan includes any treatment or investigations they feel they have previously tried and failed. If surgery is going to be considered, it is important to take a full medical history, including smoking history, to highlight any risks of surgery and any areas which may be optimised prior to surgical intervention. Additionally, a social history is important as it plays a part in the rehabilitation and discharge planning process. For example, a patient with stairs at home to get to the bathroom, they may need alternative arrangements and if not recognised preoperatively, this may delay the discharge planning. The musculoskeletal examination traditionally follows look, feel, move, test. Here we will start with look. Firstly, ensure adequate exposure of the required joints. In this case, groin to toes. However, shorts are worn here to maintain actor modesty. Ask if there is any pain before commencing, and if yes, point with one finger. Please remember that you will lose rapport with the patient and or examiner if you cause pain. Therefore, please modify your examination depending on the location of the patient's pain and examine this area last, always looking at the patient's face so that you can recognise apprehension and pain early and stop. This is particularly important in trauma patients but can equally affect chronic conditions. Some special tests will, for efficiency's sake, be performed earlier than the special test section. Remember that not all tests are needed on every patient and you should consider different tests depending on what you have found out in the history. Here we have an illustration of the anterior draw test. This would be appropriate for a patient following a twisting knee injury with giving way. However, there is no point in doing an anterior draw in a 70 year old if you are contemplating a total knee replacement as this would be removed during surgery. Nor is it worth exploring signs of patellofemoral OA in a traumatic case. Assess the lower limbs from front, sides and back, initially in the standing position. Ask your patient to turn sequentially rather than you moving around them. Globally, from all views, assess posture, skin changes such as any swelling and scar, shape and symmetry, comparing to the contralateral side. From the front, comment on muscle bulk, including quadriceps, any swellings and coronal plane deformity such as genuvarum or genuvalgum. From the sides and back, comment on gastrocnemius, any popliteal swellings, the presence or absence of sagittal plane deformity, including any fixed flexion or genu recovatum. From the side, ask the patient to push their knees back to determine if the fixed flexion is present or it's posture related. Now to a clinical example. For comparison, here, we have a 63-year-old male with severe varus osteoarthritis of the right knee and mild valgus osteoarthritis of the left knee. Ensure the ankles are together and consider an imaginary line in the center of the patient between the malleoli. The space between the right knee and this line indicates a varus deformity. Notice the marked quadriceps wasting on the right, which is greater than the left. 
Turning your attention to the left knee, notice the subtle valgus deformity around 5 degrees being normal for men and 7 degrees being normal for women. As our patient turns to the right hand side, consider again an imaginary line from the medial malleolus to the centre of the hip on each side. You notice the right knee is anterior to this line and the left is posterior to it. This illustrates a likely fixed flexion deformity of the right knee, which we will confirm later when supine, and a genuica vatum of the left knee. From the posterior view, we once again appreciate the coronal plane deformity of both knees. And from the right hand side, we once again appreciate the sagittal plane deformity of both knees. Here is the patient's anterior posterior plane film radiograph of the right knee. Notice the cardinal signs of osteoarthritis. Now to gait assessment. The gait assessment includes rate and rhythm as well as each phase of the gait cycle. Heel strike, stance, push off and swing phases as depicted here, referenced to the left lower limb, walking from top right to the left of the screen. This completes the gait cycle, and during it, comment on any abnormal gait, coronal or sagittal deformity, and or leg length discrepancy. In the frontal view, comment on foot thigh progression angle any varus or valgus thrust, or squinting or medially facing patellae. On the side on view, comment on any fixed flexion or hyperextension. Common gait abnormalities can be recalled by the mnemonic straws. S for short leg, where you step down on the short leg, then vault up on the long leg to compensate and the patient's head bobs up and down. T for Trendelenburg. Abnormal pelvic tilt resulting in the patient's head swaying from side to side. R for rigid. Characterized by hip hiking and circumduction of the leg. A for antalgic with painful shortened stance phase. Imagine walking with a stone in your shoe for example. W for weak. Location or joint involvement dictates the weak gait pattern. This can include a weak hip such as in the Trendelenburg gait. Additionally, polio patients often present with a back locking of the knee due to weakness of their quadriceps. Furthermore, foot drop due to a common perineal nerve palsy can result in a high stepping gait so they can clear the ground. Finally, S for supratentorial, including spastic, ataxic, or equinus gates. This is also a good time to dynamically assess pelvic strength, control, and patellofemoral irritability. Ask the patient to squat with both legs, then on each leg separately. This may not be possible in all patients, and so you should assess if you think the patient will be capable of doing this before asking them to do it. For a single-legged squat, it is seen that the patient internally rotates their leg and moves into a valgus position, which indicates impaired hip control as a contributor to patellofemoral joint irritability. Note here, the patient is not performing single leg squat successfully as he's compensating, hooking his leg around the posterior calf of the standing leg. Finally, don't forget to look around the room for walking aids and orthoses. Now, briefly returning to our patient with knee osteoarthritis, notice his antalgic gait with shortened stance phase on the right lower limb and the worsening varus deformity of the knee during the stance phase, known as a varus thrust. Now to the seated position. 
With the legs dangling, comment on the extensor mechanism alignment, including patella height, whether it be alta, normal, or baja. Ask the patient to straighten their knees sequentially from a flex position to assess patella tracking, in particular, J tracking, which is associated with patellofemoral joint instability. Additionally, comment on extensor mechanism integrity, including if there is any extensor lag present. Here, there is a normal alignment and the cadaveric illustration on the right demonstrates the key components of the extensor mechanism. Now to supine. When supine, assess the quadriceps angle or Q angle, which is the angle subtended by a line drawn from anterior superior iliac spine to the center of the patella and another from the center of the patella to the tibial tubercle. Increasing Q angle predisposes to development of chondromalacia and associated with patellofemoral joint instability. Normal is around 10 degrees for males and 15 degrees for females. Now to feel. While supine, palpate systematically with one finger for any signs of tenderness and or swellings. Assess for clinical warmth, the fibular head for tenderness at the LCL insertion site, lateral joint margin, lateral femoral condyle for the site of LCL origin, and the iliotibial band. Furthermore, palpate the superior pole of patella and quadriceps tendon, the inferior pole of patella and the patella tendon, medial patella, including the medial patellofemoral ligament, which may be ruptured in a patellofemoral joint dislocation. Medial joint margin, the medial tibial plateau, which is the site of the medial collateral ligament insertion, and the pes anserinus, including the sartorius, gracilis, and semitendinosus tendon insertions, also known as the goose's foot. And finally, the tibial tuberosity, followed by the popliteal fossa, the posterior aspect of the knee. This will allow you to assess for Baker's cyst and also palpate the popliteal pulse. Now to special tests. Perform the bulge or sweep test. Sweep from distal to proximal on the medial side to empty the medial compartment of the joint, then sweep from proximal to distal on the lateral side of the knee. Observe the ripple medially in the presence of an effusion. Furthermore, the patella tap is performed by pressing down on the suprapatellar pouch with the left hand and with the other hand tap the patella onto the femoral condyles. In a positive test, the patella can be felt striking the femur and bouncing off again. Now to move. Remember to note the approximate angles achieved for all movements and that active movement should always be done before passive. This allows the examiner to gauge pain levels and anticipate end range of subsequent passive assessment as well as saving time if normal. Assess active range of movement including flexion by asking the patient to pull their heels to their buttock and then extension by asking the patient to drive their knees into the bed. Remember, reduced or limited as a descriptor for range of movement does not help for future examinations or to determine how limited or reduced it is. Quantify the range with a number. Assess passive range of movement including extension by elevating the heels from the end of the bed as shown. Comment on any fixed flexion deformity such as depicted here around 15 degrees. Additionally, comment on any hyperextension or genuate recovatum such as on the right hand side which here is around 10 degrees. Additionally, Assess for crepitus during flexion extension of the knee to assess for patellofemoral joint degenerative changes. 
Now to Cruciate Ligamentous Special Tests. Please note, comparison to the contralateral side is particularly useful in informing your stability assessment by indicating their physiological normal. For anterior draw, flex the patient's knee to 90 degrees and anchor the foot by gently sitting on it. In a two-step motion, with both hands, elevate the hamstrings, grasp the upper end of tibia, and rock backwards and forwards to assess for anteroposterior glide and presence or absence of an endpoint with the anterior translation of the tibia relative to the femur. Remember, it's a two-step movement. Excessive anterior movement would indicate a positive anterior draw and denote anterior cruciate laxity. Note the posterior draw is performed in the same position, however, with posterior translation of the tibia relative to the femur. Alternatively, the anterior cruciate ligament can be assessed by the Lockman test. Flex the patient's knee to 20 degrees, with the examiner's knee supporting underneath the femur, one hand grasping the distal thigh and the other hand the proximal tibia, shifting the leg anterior relative to the femur. In a stable knee, there should be no gliding. Comment on soft, hard or absent endpoint. In this superior view of the cadaveric specimen and a dissected flex knee joint, the intact ACL can be seen from its origin at the medial wall of the lateral femoral condyle to its insertion onto the tibia anteriorly between the intercondylar eminences. It affords anterolateral and rotatory stability to the knee. Finally, the pivot shift test is a useful adjunct to the anterior cruciate ligament assessment. In this four-step test, the examiner elevates the leg with the knee in full extension, applies a valgus force to the joint, internally rotates the tibia, and then flexes the knee. In a patient with an ACL deficient knee, at around 30 degrees of knee flexion, the iliotibial band transitions from an extensor to a flexor of the knee and causes sudden posterior movement of the tibia known as the pivot shift which is seen and felt as the joint is fully reduced. Please note, this test is not always possible, particularly in an unanesthetized patient. With this cadaveric specimen, the ITB can be seen sliding over the lateral femoral condyle at around 30 degrees as it transitions from an extensor to flexor. Now to the posterior cruciate ligament. Firstly, with both knees flexed, observe and palpate for tibiofemoral step-off. The medial tibial plateau is normally stationed one centimeter anterior to the medial femoral condyle, as is the case in this patient's normal right knee. However, on the left knee, the sag sign can be observed, indicating likely PCL deficiency. The posterior draw test which is achieved using the same position as the anterior draw, however, with the tibia translating posteriorly on the femur instead. Once again, comment on presence or absence of an endpoint, with excessive posterior movement indicating PCL laxity. Note that PCL deficiency may be misinterpreted as ACL laxity, the key is to assess your initial tibial station, i.e. the starting point, and assess endpoint of both ACL and PCL. A knee joint cadaveric dissection illustrates the cut stumps of the ACL and PCL. Now to collateral ligament assessment. Assess the medial collateral ligament at zero degrees and then 30 degrees of knee flexion by applying a valgus stress with one hand holding the distal lateral thigh and the other hand abducting the leg. To assess the lateral collateral ligament, 
apply instead a varus stress with one hand holding the distal medial thigh and the other hand adducting the leg. As an alternative, especially in heavier patients, you may wish to tuck the foot under your arm. Note in extension, coronal or sideways movement is always abnormal. It may indicate torn, sprained ligaments and or capsule. Now to meniscal provocation special tests. The menisci can be assessed via the McMurray's test. For medial meniscus, flex the knee maximally, place one hand to steady the joint and the other palpates medially in the joint space while the other externally rotates and adducts the leg and slowly extends the knee. Feel and listen for a click as you do this. If present, this likely indicates a meniscal tear. For the lateral meniscus, perform the reverse maneuver by internally rotating and abducting the leg and palpating the lateral joint margin. A cadaveric dissection of the knee is shown here on the right including the knee joint with intact medial meniscus and intact lateral meniscus. Finally, complete your examination with a targeted neurovascular exam. Firstly, the popliteal artery the dorsalis pedis artery and the posterior tibial artery. Now to sensation. The superficial perineal nerve on the proximal dorsal aspect of the foot and distal leg. The saphenous nerve the deep perineal nerve between the first and second metatarsophalangeal joints distally. And the medial plantar nerve on the plantar aspect of the foot. The sural nerve, lateral aspect of the foot around the level of the fifth metatarsophalangeal joint. Now to the motor assessment. The femoral nerve, responsible for knee extension via the quadriceps muscles. The deep perineal nerve, responsible for dorsiflexion of the ankle and great toe via tibialis anterior and extensor hollicis longus, respectively. The tibial nerve, responsible for plantar flexion of the ankle and great toe via the tibialis posterior and flexor hollicis longus, respectively. The superficial perineal nerve, responsible for eversion of the ankle via the perineus brevis and longus. Thank you all for your attention. Please remember, when it comes to orthopaedic examinations, remember look, feel, move, test.